Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Time 100 Talks, Time's weekly program where we bring together extraordinary leaders, artists, activists from around the world to spotlight solutions and show a way toward progress to a better world. I'm Edward Felsenthal, Editor-in-Chief and CEO of Time. Today's program focuses on the continuing lessons we are all taking in through multiple crises in the world. We are experiencing, of course, racial injustice and major racial tensions all over the US. Schools are facing extreme challenges as they try to find ways to reopen or ensure students are educated remotely as the pandemic continues. And of course, so many individuals and families are facing economic and other uncertainty as the pandemic and its effects continue. Here to discuss how all of this intersects along with the upcoming presidential election in the United States are some terrific guests. We have with us the Senator from Hawaii, Maisie Hirono, Democrat, who will speak with Times Congress reporter, Alana Abramson, about the upcoming election, police reform, and the government coronavirus relief package, as well as what's happening with the virus in Hawaii. Times' Ashley C. Ford will speak with Vanessa Luna, founder and chief program officer of M Schools, They'll talk about how that program has adapted to help immigrant and undocumented families amid the pandemic. And we have the actress and entrepreneur, Sofia Vergara, and Neville Crawley, the CEO of Kiva, a global microfinance nonprofit organization. They'll talk about how their partnership is aiding marginalized female entrepreneurs impacted by COVID-19. We've got a lot to talk about today, so let's get started. And first up is Senator Maisie Hirono with Times' Alana Abramson. Alana? Thank you, Edward. I'm Alana Abramson. I'm a staff writer with Time Magazine, and I am joined today by Senator Maisie Hirono of Hawaii. Senator Hirono, thank you so much for joining us today. Aloha. <laughs> so I want to start by talking about the news currently dominating the headlines. President Trump visited Kenosha, Wisconsin on Tuesday, despite pleas from local officials urging him not to come. He did yes. not meet with the family of Jacob Blake, the man who was mm -hmm. shot seven times by a police officer. And he referred to police officers who use excessive force within law enforcement as bad apples. What do you make of his visit? Once again, uh, he, he uh, is all about himself. And so uh, he uh, really doesn't care about the health and safety of the people at Kenosha. Uh, the governor asked him not to come, but he went anyway because it is always all about him. And to compare what happened in the shooting to someone who froze as on a golf course is uh, bizarre, even for Trump. On that topic, the shootings of both Blake and Dijon Kazee in Los Angeles have intensified calls for police reform. Congress mm -hmm. left in August at an impasse on this issue. Do you see it moving forward imminently? Underlying all of these peaceful protests is the recognition that we have systemic racism in our country and police brutality, and they, these protesters are wanting us to act. Now, when you say Congress has enacted, the House actually passed the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act, and uh, as is usually the part for the course for Mitch McConnell, he has sat on that bill, and he, as he sat on the, the uh, HEROES Act for over three months, as millions of people are unemployed, and uh, millions are without health care, and about to be evicted, and, and all of that. So. Uh, it, it just goes to show the total lack of empathy and priority of the Republicans and certainly the total lack of leadership in dealing with the pandemic by this president. So I'm going to get to the HEROES Act, but I, mm -hmm. going on police reform, McConnell has basically said that the House bill is not something that, this, that would get through the Republican-led Senate. Do you see any point of cooperation, any sort of middle ground? Well, what they came up with was uh, a bill that Tim Scott put in, which was really, you know, I, um, I said publicly that that is a half-assed bill to deal with the issues before us, which is systemic racism and police brutality. That's what they came up with, and that's all they're going to do. Uh, so Mitch McConnell has made it plain that he does not want to deal with the reality of police brutality and Black, Black Lives Matter. So... Here we are, and the only thing that will change that is for the Democrats to take back the Senate. So you think that really the only way that police reform will ever get passed is if that the Democrats does, take back the Senate? You know, Alana, <laughs> that doesn't mean that we're not going to keep on pushing, believe me, because uh, with the president fanning the flames of uh, 
of what's happening in the, the cities. And in fact, he's evoking the, the fear of people that somehow he even said recently that there are plane loads of people coming to attack law-abiding people, I suppose, in these cities with absolutely no uh, evidence to that. But he just speak, talks like that to his face. So uh, when you have a confrontation of people who support the president you know, with the guns and everything else, uh, you're going to have uh, situations which just fans the flames. And the president does nothing but to fan the flames of that kind of of dangerous situations that he himself apparently likes because it plays to his desire to be seen as uh, some sort of a tough guy when everything is to the contrary. And <laughs> he's not facing up to the fact that we're in the midst of a pandemic with 6 million people in our country testing positive and with 180,000 deaths and climbing. He does nothing about that except to say, well, businesses should open and schools should uh, reopen without consideration of the safety aspects. It seems to be that in the aftermath of these shootings, he's really doubled down on the tactic that Joe Biden, a Joe Biden presidency would bring chaos. And that basically yes. seems to be a strategy. <laughs> Obviously, you don't think that is going to work. Tell me why you think that won't that won't be played with voters. I don't think it's particularly working if one uh, looks at any of the polls. I think that American people know that all of this is happening in the Trump presidency. It is not happening in the Biden presidency because guess what? He's not the president yet. And so once again, the president takes absolutely no responsibility for what is happening. He refuses to address the underlying cause of the peaceful protests. And in fact, he goes uh, the, the other way and, and actually finds, uh, I don't know, rationalizations for example, for that young man who killed two people and has been charged with murder, he, in fact, comes to that person's defense. So, you know, we expect our leaders to model behavior. And the behavior that President Trump constantly puts out is that uh, he's the law and order tough guy, but he does absolutely nothing to provide leadership, national leadership, to deal with the pandemic, which when if we do not get the pandemic under control, we are not going to be able to return to any level of normalcy for our economy or anything else. But he refuses to deal with it. And by the way, one of the only times that the president actually lived up to a statement he made was during the beginning part of the pandemic. First of all, he said it was a hoax. But when he finally realized it was for real, and he said, well, it's not my responsibility. So he, had, he is definitely living up to what he said, that this is not his responsibility. He puts it off on everybody else. Getting back to the pandemic response, the other thing that Congress is at an impasse at is with COVID relief. Obviously, yes. the Democrats passed the HEROES Act in yes. May. Mitch McConnell has repeatedly dismissed it at a liberal wish list. But meanwhile, mm -hmm. Americans have been without enhanced unemployment insurance for over a month, and the number of COVID cases has passed 6 million. Treasury yes. Secretary Steve Mnuchin is now saying that a bipartisan agreement should still be reached. Do you think it can be? Well, if the president and uh, the, the president chief of staff um, uh, listens to Mnuchin, and I think that it is a pretty uh, sad situation, if you ask me, that it's Mnuchin who's the voice of reason for the administration. Now, when we were confronted with the HEROES Act passed by the House, the first thing Mitch McConnell said is, well, the states should declare bankruptcy. And uh, the thing he wanted was for liability protection for corporations. That's where his, he's coming from. There's, a, there's no push for additional unemployment insurance benefits, nothing for the states, very little, if anything, to make sure that our post office, our postal service can stay in business. And so uh, it, it is very clear where their priorities are, not to mention that Mitch McConnell's caucus is not united at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm told maybe 20 Republican senators who say they're done. They don't think that they need to do anything more to help millions of people who are out of work, millions of people without health care, millions of people who are facing evictions. Uh, they don't have to do anything more. So he's got a divided caucus, a lot of which is one of the reasons that the, 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 the I don't know, piecemeal bills that they introduced a couple, about a month ago uh, is very piecemeal because they're not together on what to do. But what's clear is that this pandemic with some 40,000 
new positives every day in our country, which Dr. Fauci just recently said is totally unacceptable. Uh, they're not willing to deal with that. And you know, it, they, it's awesome to listen to the president and his version of reality, which is not what um, people in our country are facing. So in spite of the fact that the president is, is running around having these rallies where everybody sits cheek to jaw with nobody wearing masks, um, he acts as though the pandemic is over and people in our country know otherwise because they know that, uh, that they are uh, being exposed to this virus. Do you think that there can be a middle ground that's reached? Well, Nancy has said that she will go down to a $2 trillion bill uh, if the Republicans will come up and we're not there yet. My hope is that we will somehow get there, but meantime, we, do, we are facing a government shutdown and if we don't appropriate money to keep government going, and so there are any number of pressures that are uh, coming down the pike. And uh, all the president can talk about is plane loads of people coming to attack people in our cities. He is living in a total unreal Trump world. Do you think that Congress will be able to pass a spending bill by the deadline of September 30th? I am not- <laughs> Loaded question. Respect, but if anything, you know, we don't, I think even Mitch McConnell will say that he doesn't want uh, another government shutdown. Uh, and so we'll probably pass a continuing resolution to get us through uh, until the following year or whatever the time frame may be. But there's no question that in the midst of the pandemic, the last thing we need to do is impose more harm on the people in our country by shutting down government. So in terms of the hardships that different states are facing, your home state of Hawaii was actually trending downwards for a while and now yes it's spiking back up and restrictions are being posed, imposed again. What yes. do you think went wrong? Why, why do you think that happened? Well, what we're dealing with is a transmission issue. And so our numbers remain low per you know, 100,000, whatever that matrix is. But this is what happens when people begin to relax what they're doing and not paying attention to the fact that we need to continue to wear masks, do social distancing, uh, to wash our hands and all the things that Dr. Fauci keeps repeating on a daily basis. That's what we have to do. And this is why when restrictions are relaxed all across the country, you're seeing an increase in the number of cases. And this is why, you know, we're not going to get uh, control over this virus until we all take the individual responsibility. And again, we expect the uh, president to model behavior and the president is going in the opposite direction. Uh, by making wearing masks somehow un unpatriotic, then it's actually the opposite. This is what we ought to be doing. This is America where we care about each other, wear masks to protect others. Uh, and so we have a president who goes in the opposite direction. And yeah, he goes to all these rallies where people are not wearing masks and you will see uh, positive cases arising out of these rallies. Now contrast that with Joe Biden, who is a responsible a caring adult in the room. And so in this election, Alana, there is a clear choice as to what, whether we want to see four more years of chaos and uh, mindless cruelty, because in the president's desire to open up schools without paying attention to the safety for our teachers and people who work in our schools and our, our students, he w wanted to do away with the meal program in a way that actually made sense for the people who had to get them get their meals. So he wanted to end that uh, so that people would have to go back to school. And th this is where he's coming from. It's what I call mindless cruelty and it, it's uh, systemic with this president. So in terms of schools, Hawaii, in part because of these, are, these case numbers rising, decided to start their schools virtually. So most of the public schools are obviously starting virtually. Yes a lot of the private schools are starting in person because they have the funds to make sure that mm -hmm. it's done safely. Educational experts are saying that this is just going to exacerbate educational inequities. What would you, oh, yeah. what are you telling to parents who are concerned that their children are going to fall behind because they're in the public school system? What I'm hearing from the parents is first and foremost, they want their kids to go into a safe environment 
and they do not feel assured that that's what we're going to be providing. Clearly, there needs to be resources. This is why the HEROES Act needs to be passed that will provide more resources. You know, if you're going to have smaller classrooms, for example, you have to hire more teachers. Uh, we know that there are a lot of kids traumatized by what they're experiencing through this traumatic, uh, this, this pandemic. So you need to hire psychologists, therapists, counselors. Uh, you need to make sure that there are cleaning supplies. There are a whole range of things that we need to do to ensure that our schools can open safely. And, and so this is another thing that, that Joe Biden has said. He would listen to the experts and the scientists on how we can safely reopen our schools. And he would push for the resources that's needed to enable our schools to reopen. And that's why uh, federal support is necessary. And that's not forthcoming from the Republicans in the Senate. Should that be a priority in any of the COVID relief packages? Of course. Of course. We so all want the schools to reopen, Alana. And, and in fact, I was talking with the uh, teachers. Uh, for one thing, they have to get retrained. Uh, many of them, uh, where they have to get trained to do distance teaching. And then one of the teachers, she said when she first started distance uh, teaching, that maybe about 40% of her classroom kids were participating. By the end of the term, it was only about 10%. So there's a huge drop off, which uh, also you know, acknowledges that uh, uh, distance learning is really tough for the students to pay attention and all that. So there's uh, learning loss that is happening that we all need to, to deal with. And then it's uh, also been pointing out that, that not every child has access to uh, the internet. Right. Uh, and so part of what we did with the CARES Act was to provide funding to enable connectivity, but it's still not 100%. So there are any number of huge uh, challenges facing reopening of our schools. We all want our schools to reopen because uh, aside from the safety issues, I am really concerned about the learning loss that is occurring with our kids. When you talk to constituents, when you talk to these teachers, these parents, what's the number one thing that they say they want from the federal government? in terms of the next relief package? They want to have the resources necessary to reopen our schools. But that also means that we need to get a better control over the spread of this virus. And so the governor recently imposed a stay at home order because that's what we should be doing since we do see the, an increase in the number of positive cases and a continuous reinforcement of the need to wear masks, to wash our hands, social distancing, do not go into crowded spaces. All the things that the president never talks about, but thank goodness Dr. Fauci does. He's hammers that home every day. Uh, and the other thing, Alana, is uh, uh, that when we have a vaccine, which uh, the vaccine has to be both safe and effective, we don't want to cut any corners on the safety or effectiveness of a vaccine. And that is why the CDC, the, the FDA, have to be left alone to do their jobs and based on science. And But we already know that there's a lot of political pressure being placed on all of these entities that uh, you know, the president just wants a, a vaccine. He wants it by next month. Uh, we actually have a process for determining whether a vaccine is effective and safe. And we should not be cutting those corners because people will not uh, trust government to provide a safe vaccine if all they're hearing is uh, interference, political interference with what should be a medical scientific basis for developing such a vaccine. So we've talked a lot about how a lot of things in Congress are stalled because Republicans and Democrats can't come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. Democrats polling is showing that they could take back the Senate, and that sparked a conversation about whether or not you should get rid of the filibuster, which, as you know, requires 60 votes to pass. Do you think that Democrats should try and get rid of it so that votes pass by majority legislation? I was of, of, of the opinion that the filibuster was important to retain uh, minority voices, but notice that we Democrats in them are in the minority and it's not as though our voices are being protected. Frankly, I am open to filibuster reform because we cannot continue with this kind of impasse in, uh, in the Senate. And uh, frankly, Mitch McConnell really opened the door to that when he totally did away with a 60 vote requirement for confirming Supreme Court justices. The Democrats held the line on you know, the Supreme Court justices, but Mitch McConnell threw it right off the window because he needed to confirm two more justices. And so that's where they're going. 
I look at all of the challenges facing us because when Joe, ba- when Joe uh, and Kamala get elected, that is my hope, of course, uh, because the alternative is continuous chaos and mindless cruelty perpetuated by uh, the cult of Trump. Uh, there's going to be a lot of rebuilding that we're going to need to do, a lot of coming together. Uh, the, the things are not going to change overnight, of course. So we need a leadership that will pay attention to what we actually need to do based on facts, based on science, based on what's best for uh, our people as opposed to what's best for Trump. Obviously, mm-hmm. our country is in unprecedented turbulence right now. What has given you hope historically during tough times and what's giving you hope now? <laughs> I think there are a lot of young people who I I would say they have woke and they're going to stay woke. They're going to remain engaged and look at the voter turnout. You know, if we can uh, withstand the voter suppression that is taking place all across the country, not to mention what's happening with the Postal Service, the kind of voter turnout that we saw in Massachusetts uh, means that people are very engaged. And believe me, when they think that somebody's trying to take away their vote, I think that incentivizes them even more. I think the choices, the clear choices that our country is facing between continuing chaos with the president and this quixotic kind of snake oil leadership that he's providing uh, with regard to the pandemic, which is no leadership, versus uh, the kind of adult leadership uh, that uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will bring. There, there's a clear choice, and I think there are a lot of people who are going to come out to vote. And that, that is another reason that we need to support the Postal Service. And, and the fact that uh, the Postmaster DeJoy, who my friend Amy said he's actually no joy, and when he says that he has put a pause on all these things that have led to delays and people getting their medications, Social Security checks, and uh, sending in their uh, ballots, it is hard to really take the word of any uh, Trump uh, acolyte, and that's what the Postmaster General is. And so we have to remain vigilant, and that's what we're going to do. I am uh, uh, energized by the young people who are out there and all the people who want justice done in our country, and they want police reform that's meaningful. And so I am uh, energized by all the people who are coming forward to uh, uh, say, you know what, we are a country that that should be the leader in dealing with pandemics. We should be the leader on taking care of our people and making sure that people have opportunities. These are not just words to me because, Alana, you know, I'm an immigrant. I came here with nothing. And this is a country that provided me with opportunities uh, for uh, for education and all that. And, and that's what the Democrats want to do. But first, we have to get control over this pandemic. And in that, We each bear individual responsibility to prevent the spread of this virus by being um, aware that we need to wear our, you know, masks and wash our hands and do all of those things. Each one of us as an American, I think we should be duty bound to do those things that, that will protect not just ourselves, but others. Well, Senator Hirono, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you very much. Everyone stay safe, be kind. Welcome back. You're watching Time 100 Talks. I'm Edward Felsenthal, CEO and Editor-in-Chief of Time. If you haven't already, follow us on social. You can use the hashtag Time 100 Talks. And up next is Time 100 Talks correspondent Ashley C. Ford, who will be speaking with Vanessa Luna, the founder and chief program officer of M Schools. Ashley? Thank you so much, Edward. And thanks for joining us, Vanessa. Let's get right into it. Can you talk to me a little bit about M Schools and its resources for students and their families? I'm also interested in the motivating factors for you starting this program. Yeah, so, you know, I have had, we have the honor to partner with our undocumented students and families in creating safe and welcoming schools for our immigrant community. For me, I grew up undocumented in New York. I was a former documented teacher, so I had 
DACA and actually was able to teach. And I taught in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and New York City. And I witnessed firsthand how our undocumented and mixed status students and families experience unique challenges in the K-12 system that are intersected with issues around both immigration and also education and educational equity. And so that really was the reason why uh, myself and my other two co-founders who are also immigrant women and formerly undocumented decided to think about what the K-12 system could be like if it was welcoming and inclusive of our immigrant community. Since then, since our launch, we've been able to impact over 2,000 educators in ensuring that they have the right tools and resources wow. on how to support our undocumented community. And also we've been able to directly impact over 1,000 students and families directly, ensuring they have access mm. to knowledge on their rights, higher education, and beyond. One of the things that's making all of this really interesting right now, obviously, is the pandemic. Schools are opening back up um, after being closed, online classes, who has access to the internet, who doesn't. How is M Schools sort of shifting what it usually did to continue to assist these families in getting the educational experience they deserve? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, for COVID, our response was directly informed by our community. Before we took mm -hmm. any action, we sought out to connect with parents, with families, with students directly before taking a course on what we should do. Our response was a combination of financial assistance because a lot of them were unable to receive any type of aid from both the federal government and then the state and the cities that they lived in. So we were honored able to fundraise over $150,000 over a period mm. of three months and directly disperse those resources to undocumented and mixed status families. In addition to that, we have shifted all of our programs now to the virtual setting. So we actually use a lot of Zoom, a lot of WhatsApp groups, which families were the ones who told us those were the ways in which they wanted to engage and be able to connect with resources and develop a community of trust. Recently, uh, we received information around, for example, the New York City Department of Education changing and thinking about reopening schools at a later date. And so all of that information has been dispersed already to our families in the languages that they speak. And so now we're getting together uh, to connect with families around resources and supports. At the same time that we're doing that, we're also partnering with our schools and our school districts, which we are located out in Texas, here in New York, and we're starting work in New Jersey this school year as well. And so we're going to continue our work, but now in a virtual context, and it's all being driven by what our families have told us and by their leadership and power. You know, in June, the Supreme Court prevented the Trump administration from ending DACA, which, you know, so many people saw as a huge win. But how does that directly impact the community that you serve? Yeah, well, I think there's, I want to name that DACA, right? As a former beneficiary of the program, I, I was a documented recipient. It uh, definitely mm -hmm pave the way for my trajectory right now. I am very much aware about how DACA can impact someone's trajectory. I think it's just, it's a snippet of what our immigrant community deserves and what our undocumented community in particular has been fighting for for many, many, many years. And so right now, there's just so much information and so many updates that are happening in regards to DACA. And there's a lot of misinformation out there, which I think has been intentional from the, far, mm. from the part of this co current government and this current administration to create a lot of confusion around what you are supposed to do and not supposed to do. So I've had parents who have young children who are thinking about, you know, can I apply to DACA? And at the moment, if you're a new applicant, you can't apply to DACA. If you're a current beneficiary of the program, you could renew, but now it's been changed that it's from two years to one year. So all mm. of this information, right, and all of the things that are occurring mm. are currently being challenged by advocates, by leaders, and by lawyers uh, that are currently suing the administration for their handling of the Supreme Court decision. But in the meantime, it's creating a lot of uncertainty and misinformation. So I urge, urge, mm. urge everyone on here, but especially our 
immigrant and undocumented families to go to homeishere.us, which is a part of a coalition that we are a part of, and to get mm -hmm. informed around DACA updates because they're going to be continuous. Vanessa, personally, what has it been like for you the last four years being a DACA recipient? Yeah, and I think for me, you know, I received the program right out of college. And so I was able to take advantage of the program. Uh, prior to that, I was going to continue supporting my mom as a domestic worker. I'm a proud daughter of domestic workers. And so that was going to be what I was going to do. And I was not necessarily going to use my degree. DACA really paved the way for me to be able to achieve my dream, which was to be a teacher. Still the greatest job I have ever had and one of the main reasons why I'm still committed to the K-12 system. As I have now transitioned into getting a petition from family because I've been able to at least seek out to adjust my status, I have seen the power of the immigrant community to advocate for themselves, to seek out resources and supports and truly remembering that we didn't receive DACA out of a presidency, but rather it came from immigrant youth who advocated, who advocated for themselves, for their family, and who are going to continue to do so, uh, regardless of what may come in the fall of this year. So I think that's what my experience has been. I've been able to kind of tap into the power of my immigrant story and realize mm -hmm. that my immigration status it's just one piece of my larger identity. And now I have the tools to support other people that come after me. How can people who hear what you're saying and think, I wanna get involved, I wanna know how to help, I wanna be able to keep up with this information, I wanna be more informed on this, where should they go? Where should they start? Yeah, well, I definitely think that you know immigration and immigration policy, when you first look at it, it can be really overwhelming. And so I know a little bit about it because of my own lived experience, right? But I am also not an immigration lawyer. And I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of complexities within immigration and immigration policy. But we can go from really small actions to larger ones. We can go mm -hmm. for us thinking, have we supported immigrant, immigrant entrepreneurs? Have we supported organizations that are being led by immigrants that are thinking about and really have been those that have financially supported many undocumented families during this really uncertain and challenging time. We could also think about in our roles, right, in our specific jobs, have you elevated the stories and the impact of those directly impacted? Are they a part of the decision-making process in your organization, in your school, in whatever entity you work and are a part of? Are you always thinking about how your actions are going to impact the immigrant and undocumented community who are a part of this country. And then I also think we can think larger. We can think about advocating, advocating for whether it's state, local, or even federal support to ensure that our immigrant families are part of any type of stimulus package that is provided in regards to COVID. They have to be a part of it because COVID has shown us how we are all so deeply intersected. And because they are human, beings. Simple. And then we could even take it higher, right? If you are eligible to vote. And I name that because I've been in the country for 20 years and I'm still not eligible to vote. And so I think there's this idea that everybody can vote. We know that folks that have been formerly incarcerated also cannot vote, right? And so right. it is important that we understand that when we say go out and vote, there's complexities within that. And there may be folks who do fit that and who may not. So if you are able to vote, I urge you to do that. I urge you to get as many of your friends as possible to do so, and then to be ready on whoever may win this election coming in November to hold them accountable for the rights and the power of mm -hmm. our immigrant students and families in our schools. I also, I think this last piece is important to name, especially with this current context in regard to Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter movement. We have to start really, really thinking about how immigrants, especially black immigrants, are impacted by both the intersection of immigrant, immigrant justice, and the current, you know, really reckoning of what it means to be a black immigrant in this country. It is understanding mm. from our end that we know that there are actually about four times more likely to be detained and deported. And so wow. as somebody who is not, who's a non-black Latinx woman, I have to 
be really conscious about how I show up in this space and understand mm -hmm. that I need to uplift that experience and that voice, not only now, but forever. I have one more question for you. Where are you finding hope right now? It's a high stakes election year, a lot going on. Where are you finding? Yeah, there's a lot happening. And, and honestly, I think our, you know, our immigrant community gives me a lot of hope. I think that oftentimes when we talk about these issues is very much, you know, bloom and doom, right? Mm -hmm. But in the middle of it all, I have families who, who are texting me on WhatsApp and are finding joy. Or I have, I think about an immigrant mother who right now is going to, she's seeking out business classes so that she could start her own business while supporting her child with remote learning, while trying to understand everything that's happening. And so that to me brings me a lot of hope. And I think every time I support a parent or anyone at M schools, um, I think a lot about my family. And I think a lot about what it could have been if I would have received these supports when I was in school or what the trajectory would have been like for my parents. So I, I get hope daily from our immigrant community. Vanessa Luna, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much, Ashley. Take care. Welcome back to Time 100 Talks. Our final guests on today's program are the actress and entrepreneur, Sofia Vergara, and Kiva CEO, Neville Crawley. They'll be speaking with my colleague, Reza Bruner, whom I'll turn it over to now. Reza? Thanks, Edward. I'm staff writer, Reza Bruner, and I'm joined by actor, Sofia Vergara, and CEO of Kiva, Neville Crawley. Welcome to Time 100 Talks. So Sophia, this spring you launched a partnership with Kiva, which is a global microfinance nonprofit to support their COVID-19 response fund. Why is this cause and this partnership important to you? Well, um, I've always supported and believed in microfinance. I've seen the impact that providing small businesses, business loans to um, marginate, marginalized communities uh, can have and especially women owned businesses. It gives them the resources that they need that uh, to afford education, medical needs. And, you know, it was great to be partnering with Kiva because uh, to launch this global fund and because they have all the experience that we need for this and they have all the resources. And it was perfect to support minority and female entrepreneurs and, you know, all these group of people that are so in trouble because of the coronavirus. Absolutely. And Neville, can you walk us through a little bit about how Kiva works and how this fund has managed to support some of these marginalized groups who are impacted? Sure. So Kiva, we've been operating for 15 years and we've lent out about one and a half billion dollars in 90 countries around the world. And a, a typical Kiva borrower is it someone in an underserved community? Could be right here in the US, could be around the globe, but it's someone who doesn't have access to traditional finance. It's often an entrepreneur, 80% of our borrowers are women, so it, it's really kind of at the edge of finance. Now, with um, our, our partnership with Sophia and the COVID-19 fund, we saw a particular need in this moment to get additional capital and get capital quickly. And so through this fund, we've had corporate partners, individual lenders, foundations all participate. It's allowed us to move a lot of money out quickly to people who really, even a day or two quicker to get financing can make a difference between staying in business and going out of business. Yeah. Are there any specific examples or businesses that you've been excited to see have a little bit of success because of Kiva's plans? Um, well, I mean, it's super important because, um, you know, microfinance is like a tool to, to help empower these women to, to create their own income. And two examples that I love is one uh, from a Colombian woman, Liliana. She lives in Brazil. She's a, a refugee. And she was, you know, making a living by selling Colombian food to the locals. But when the, vi the pandemic happened, she had just um, rented a space 
to have her own restaurant finally and she had to close down like everybody else. But with a small loan from Kiva, she was able to um, change her business and now she's making food and she is making money by delivering to the houses. So, so that's amazing. And for example, here in the United States, um, Kelly, it's a girl from Pittsburgh that she owned an art store and she had to close also. She was not selling anything. So with a 6,000 loan from Kiva, she, you know, reinvented her own business and now she's giving art classes online. So, you know, it's, it's very inspiring and it's great to see that it, we can really, you know, help these people survive this in these horrible times. Yeah, and I'm sure those are only, you know, a couple of the many stories. Yes. And I'm, I'm curious, Neville, how you see Kiva specifically adapting to support these women, especially during this time. I said the, one of the most important things is the speed of lending. There are a few different things, but speed is very important. So we've been able to fund, in some cases, loans literally in a matter of hours, sometimes in a matter of days. So that's very, very important. Um, because the money is crowdfunded, there's also there's a couple of things in there. One is the crowd can be forgiving in a way that a financial institution can't necessarily. So we've been able to introduce interest-free payment periods of up to six months if someone gets in, you know, needs a little more time with their business. We've been able to introduce credit limits. So we've been able to do a whole bunch of things. This has always been a part of Kiva, but it feels even more important now, is crowdfunding, it's the community lending. So it also gives people the message that the community's around you, they want you to be in business, and people feel supported, as well as having access to the capital. So Kiva has an international focus. I think you mentioned, Neville, like over 60 countries you have worked in. Um, and especially right now, it can be really difficult for people to think beyond just their immediate communities. Um, what would you like to say about why it's important for people, no matter where you live, to think about engaging in the broader global um, philanthropic space and microfinance space? Um, Sophia, why do you think we need to start looking you know, beyond our borders as well as within our own communities? Well, I think uh, COVID affected everyone. It didn't care about any borders or anything. Everyone was forced to stay home. The economies were closed. Those in marginalized populations are always the, the first ones to get hit. So entrepreneur and small businesses um, around the world, they need our help. They need us to survive because nobody else is helping them quick enough, like banks or the government. So they need us to recover from this pandemic as soon as they can. And microfinance makes their lives immediately better. It fuels local economies, creates jobs. It, it you know, it helps inspire new businesses. So I need, you know, it's, it's amazing. We need to keep doing it. Neville, do you have anything to add about that need to look beyond our own borders? I guess I would just add that, you know, there's more than a billion people in the world who, who today in 2020 don't even have a bank account. They're so far from having access to finance. Yeah. So the thing that we're doing with crowdfunding here, it really is critical to reach those people. And, and my great fear here is that the, the way that COVID is impacting the world, it's impacting the most vulnerable and the most invisible communities the most. And you have people who over the last decade have really lifted themselves up to kind of like the first rung of middle class ladder. You know, they've become a small business owner, they're putting their kids through school, they're kind of really working hard on this. And COVID has the potential, I mean, unless without intervention, has the probability of setting back those hundreds of million people to where they were, and it will take decades for themselves to, to lift themselves back out again. So it's really critical that we have this intervention now and that we have it at scale. I think that's one of the things that, that um, a lot of us don't think about is the lack of access to financial institutions, and especially when you're on that first rung of the ladder, how precarious that position is. Um, so, you know, is there anything else that people should be doing or can do to help support uh, that specific slice that, that is in such a tricky situation right now? I, I think, I think there's, there's lots of good things that people can be doing. You know, there's, there's moments for just direct giving when you're know, in crisis situations, and then, of course, what we're focused on is helping people to rebuild. So, I mean, selfishly for Kiva, I'd ask people just to come to our website and you can literally see people, see the faces, see the stories, and just directly not only make a loan, you know, for as little as $25, you can start changing someone's life, but you can also just read about stories and read people's struggles. And one of the things I find most rewarding, you know, when I, I do my own lending on Kiva, just, just like anyone else, is when you get the first repayment back, 
then you realize, oh my God, that, this is working. You know, this, this person, like they took the money and they did the thing and they're making a repayment. Yeah. This is working for them. So I think it's lending, but it's also just becoming aware and getting engaged with the need. Sophia, you're an entrepreneur yourself. Um, can you talk a little bit about your own connection to the concept of entrepreneurship and, and why you see this as a really important thing for, especially for women and especially uh, women who don't have, you know, access to traditional financial institutions to, to be a part of? Well, you know, um, I think actually personally, I mean, I feel like it liberates you when you're able to control uh, your income. And usually, you know, women are the ones that they don't spend their money on partying alcohol. You know, they spend it in their family, helping their, helping, you know, the kids, helping the family. So I think it's super important to help them because I think, you know, it spreads, it spreads more and we're, I, I feel like like women have a lot to gi- a lot to give, and personally, I love that Kiva does that. That they really, really, you know, try to make an effort to help these, um, you know, not only minorities and finals, fin- like s- small, you know, communities, but they're really focusing on helping women. So I think we've all gone through quite a learning curve during this pandemic. Um, I've been six months in one place personally, and I can only imagine how that has shaped both of your experiences as well. Um, So I'll start with you, Neville, as a leader of an organization. Um, What kind of changes have you needed to make to your company's work and processes? um, And what has been encouraging to you especially during a time that's really challenging economically and challenging to get people to um, be comfortable giving and contributing. So we're, we're, we're fortunate. Operationally, we already have a presence in Nairobi, a presence in Bangkok. We're kind of all over the US. We're a bunch of other places. So we were already on sort of Zoom every day and so forth. So we, we were sort of fortunate to you know, hit the ground running in that sense. But I, I feel like 2020 uh, for us, the mission just feels so raw and so relevant now you know even when i live in san francisco and i walk down the street and i see restaurants that i used to go to or small stores that are shut and and they're not coming back so just the urgency we're trying to operate at such a pace because we know that every day makes a real difference so i feel you know we feel we just feel so critically needed right now i'm kind of fortunate that you know me and the team is all in and also i'd say for our community we've seen more lenders we've seen uh, more people putting money onto the platform to lend out. So even though people are going through economic hardship, we saw, I think from April to April last year to this year, we saw 70% growth or something in, in users. So it, it's really, I feel so heartened that even though we're all going through tough times, that people are still coming to Kiba, making loans and helping others. That's very interesting. And what about for you, Sophia, personally, professionally, how has all of this shake up um, changed you or what have you been learning? Well, when it all started, I think we were all panicking. I was panicking like everybody else. I was, you know, like I felt like I was hiding with my family inside the house and I felt very lucky that I was able you know to be in in the comfort of my house I was like you know having my my son my niece my dogs feeding them having time with them I didn't have to like worry that what you know I could sit in my house and not do anything and and we could still have all of these things and that's when I realized we needed to do something and that's when I realized uh, Kiva could help me, you know, uh, help other people. And that's why I wanted to support Kiva in, the, in this uh, fund. I think, um, you know, right now it's so important that we support each other. And I hope that, you know, like he was saying, people are now, you know, coming forward. People that don't have too much, they give a little bit. I hope that this, you know, even after the pandemic, we keep going. We keep working towards financial inclusion for everybody because this is the only way that a lot of people are going to be able to survive now and after this. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're looking at the year ahead um, and sort of planning for, you know, how these long-term economic and pandemic-related changes might impact uh, the work of Eva, um, what kind of things do you have in mind? What are you excited about? Um, Neville, we'll start with you. 
Well, we're, we're, we're definitely excited to continue to work with Sophia on the COVID fund because as, as Sophia was saying, it's not about just a crisis now, it's about economic recovery and it's about building resilience for people. So we're, we're still very focused on that. And really what we've seen at Kiva in kind of other crises around the world that we've seen over the past 15 years, the demand for capital, the demand for a few hundred, a few thousand dollars, once recovery starts to kick in or once we get past this initial phase, it comes roaring back. So I think the, the COVID relief fund and the need for capital is actually only going to get stronger as the coming months. So we're just kind of super focused on enrolling people in the mission um, you know, with Sophia promoting the work that we're doing and ultimately getting people to engage and, and lend a hand to folks who really need it. Yeah. And Sophia, how are you planning on continuing your involvement or um, what would you like to see happen as a result of, of your advocacy so far? Well, I do want to encourage my followers and to my fans to donate. It can be, you know, a small donation or even by just spreading the word. And like I said, I would love this awareness and this increase in funding to continue well after the pandemic. So we're always helping each other and keep working towards uh, the financial inclusion that I think we need. I'm very excited, very excited because, you know, we're on the right track with the fund. We, you know, done even more than we thought we were going to do. So I'm very excited to see what we're going to be able to do in the future. And um, there's one more question that we ask a lot of guests on Time 100 Talks. And I always find that the responses are um, meaningful and that is what gives you hope right now and what's um inspiring you to you know keep moving forward during this strange era so sophia i don't know not watching the news <laughs> if i don't watch the news i don't want to i mean i don't want to do anything i don't want to think about the future it's so confusing um, you know, it's so hard because we're in the middle of this pandemic, we're in the, in the middle of an election. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy. All, also, all the, the, the things that are happening, the nature that nature is doing, you know, hurricanes and earthquakes and things. I mean, it's, it's never ending. So I don't, I, I am obsessed with the news and my husband gets really really mad um so i try you know to focus on things like little stories like the ones we have you know with kiva because it makes it makes you realize oh my god like just this small amount can change the life of a whole family that amazes me you know it doesn't have to be millions of dollars that these people have to to receive just something that you know gives them a little uh oomph so that's very hopeful, it gives me a lot of hope. What about you, Neville? Well, you know, I, I feel like I'm in an immensely privileged position to be able to be of service at Kiva right now. You know, I think there's a lot of people who want to help and it's challenging. Where, as I said, some of us have been in our homes for six months. So it, it feels on a, on a personal level, I get a lot of energy and, and just hope from, from being in this position. But, but I think when I, you know, Sophia said, <laughs> tune into the news cycle a little bit too much or something and start to, you know, feel, feel that anxiety. I think I come back to these stories of people and communities helping each other. And, and really, I've just seen, seen so much power in that, that someone just saying, I'm going to help you and I'm not asking for anything back from it. I just want to, you know, see you do well. It's so, it's so profoundly changing for, for both parties. So I think I, I draw hope and energy from just these, from community and small acts of kindness. Yeah. And what you said earlier about how you've seen growth in that um, interest in giving is, is so encouraging as well. So uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you so much, Sophia and Neville, for joining us today for Time 100 Talks. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Neville. Thank you. Bye. That concludes today's program. Thanks to all of you for watching and being with us. Thanks to all of our guests and contributors for the great conversations. If you'd like more information about Time 100 Talks, past, present, and future, you can get it at time.com slash time100talks. We'll be back soon with another program. Until then, stay well. See you then.